Good morning, everyone. I'm very honored to be here today. I'd like to express my gratitude to the Kids and Kale Nation for allowing us to speak on their territory. I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation to tell our story. But before I start um, my presentation, I'd like to introduce <coughs> I'd like to introduce my mom, Matilda Mary Wilson from Gita Max. And she'll start off with um, an overview of some of the history um, regarding my sister's murder. Um, while she's doing her presentation, I'll pass her out to um, books that we have developed. They're not completely finished, but they have information on some of the uh, news and um, that we've collected throughout the year. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. very honored to stand here today and I thank all the people involved that, that has put up this event. It's very important that we all listen to the speakers today as this is, uh, the, this event is to try and end the violence in this world. What I'd like to say today and this message is, is for hope and for understanding and peace and love. 17 years ago, I lost a child, my youngest child. She was my youngest daughter. Her name was Ramona Lisa Wilson. She was 16 years old when she was murdered outside the vicinity of Smithers. And her murder has never been solved after 17 years. Ramona was an outgoing person and very, very intelligent. And, and, and she was very giving in every way. You can trust her with, with your problems because she, she always wants to listen to what you have to say and she tries to help along. Since she was 12 years old, she, uh, she, she told me that she wanted to be a psychologist and that's what her goal was. She was working up to that. She was in grade, grade nine when, when, when she was murdered. Uh, she, she had so many potentials. Uh, she had her dreams and, and she was a member of the Smithers Community Service. Uh, she, she had a lot of things going for her. She was in a, in a girls baseball team she was a bubbly little girl. In our household, she, uh, there was always laughter and jokes because uh, she, she just loved teasing her brothers to death. Uh, she has four brothers and, and one sister here. <clears throat> Everyone was so ecstatic when she was born because um, the, the brothers only had one sister. And, and my oldest daughter here was, was just overjoyed that she was going to have a little sister. <clears throat> and, and you know, uh, we, we, we never thought it would come to, to this, that, that my daughter would be murdered and, and it would never be solved. We, we stood here as myself, as a mother. I, I started, I started uh, hollering and screaming 
and getting the attention of the media and the newspapers that my baby was missing. She was missing for, for 10 months. And then on April 10th, 1995, her remains were found by a couple of guys that were out four by four behind the Smithers Airport area. And then that was very devastating. Even though we, we didn't have a closure, and, and she was buried, we, but we still don't know who committed this, this murder. We're still, we're still waiting for answers today, 17 years, June 11, 1994. And it, it's, it's just been such a trying time for, for our whole family. Some of my sons are, have, have driven themselves into alcohol. And it's so sad to see. I've, I've tried to talk to them to uh, to go for treatment, uh, but but they're not ready. I don't know if they'll ever be ready because it, it will kill them in the end. And uh, that's another thing uh, I have to worry about. And one thing I'm so proud of is my daughter standing here. Uh, she, uh, she, she has fifth dream going on to six years. She has lifted me up. I was ready to die when my youngest daughter died because uh, I just, I just felt I had no. Uh, no more life in me after the way she was married. But my daughter Brenda had talked to me and said, please mom, we need you. We don't want to lose you. It's hard enough that we've lost our baby sister. So that's why I'm standing after 17 years. I've, I've done my rallies, I've done my meetings, I've done my walks. And I will keep on till the day I die. I have 16 grandchildren and I have some great grandchildren. They will carry on until this violence ends. For 17 years, I've been trying to understand why would a why would a person kill a beautiful girl, a 16-year-old girl? Is she so kind and giving? And for 17 years, I understood that the reason I was trying to understand the reason why these people do this. Was because they never had no nurturing, no love. And and how are you supposed to give love? And how are you supposed to search for love when you don't know what love is? That that's what I think. This this is what happened to these people that murdered. And uh, that's where my message is. We have to understand about the, the murderers and the sexual abuse. Why, why it happens, you, you have to get to the root of it all. This way, when we understand these people, we, we will help them in, in many ways we can. We will be able to live with them, probably. Uh, my heart is so heavy because
because thinking of the of the other families, the mothers especially that have not found their loved ones, we we are just lucky. We prayed so hard, and people prayed for us to find Ramona. And you know, every day that I wake up, I, I pray for the mothers, and before I go to bed, I pray for the mothers and the families that they would have some kind of peace. Their, their babies are okay, they, they have gone with the Lord. They are okay. I send this message to you. Your, your children are okay. The, the only thing is that I, that I pray that, that one day we will find all of them so, so we can put a closure to, to the families. It's, it's so hard for the families not to have a closure for their loved ones. I, I understand it because for 10 months when I didn't know where my daughter was, I, I had everything going in my mind that she was being tortured or, or being held against her will. But here she was, uh, she was laying in the bush for 10 months. We were hoping, we were hoping against hope that, that she, she, uh, she would be alive. But you know, uh, as hard as it is, we, we, we got her back. And that's what these families want too, to, to get their children back so, so they can bury them. I send this message out to all of you. You look after each other, no matter what, even if you don't know the person. You, you just talk to them and ask them if, if, you know, if they need help or, or you know, just, just be there for, for, for anyone. I want to say to all of you, life is so short. We don't have no time for, for, for you know, bitterness. The whole uh, the whole answer to, to living right is forgiveness and to understand each other. That's the message I sent to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, my mother. I'm so proud of her for being able to be here today with me. Um, like she said, she's had the struggles um, dealing with the death of her youngest child. But also, I want to stand here today to share our story, to give you an overview of the impacts that we as a family have endured over the last 17 years. I'm also here to gather information and resources from you. You are people that can assist the families that are enduring an ongoing pain that will be in their hearts for the rest of their lives. As, you, as I tell you our story, think about what you can do to assist other families that would have experienced a similar scenario. And then in closing, we'll honor the missing and murdered women with a song and prayers. Ramona Lisa Wilson was born February 15, 1978 in Smithers. Ramona was the youngest girl in our family. When Ramona was first born, she was the apple of our eye. I was so happy to have such a beautiful baby sister. I have four
four brothers, so to have the cutest little girl added to our family was a godsend. Ramona was fair-skinned with dark hair and eyes. She was always our baby, no matter how old she was. We always made sure Ramona was dressed well and her hair was always fixed. The best part I loved about my baby sister was being able to dress her up in cute little jackets and bonnets. Her favorite color, or my favorite color, <laughs> was pink. <laughs> and I just loved fixing her hair because it was, when she was little, it was curly. And as she grew to this beautiful young woman, it became straight. Her older brothers were always overprotective of her. From the time she was born until she was about seven years old, they always carried her around like a baby. Ramona liked to tease and laugh with our family. Although my mother was a single parent, she always ensured that we celebrated our birthdays and Christmas. So right now, you might be thinking that we fit into the many statistics of single parents, poverty, and a dysfunctional family. So I have the question of, was this our fate? Did we deserve this? And did we bring this on to ourselves? Despite what the statistics may say about us, our love for each other is very true and very deep. When one of us is hurting, we all know it. The more we talk about the day before or a week before Ramona went missing, we realize that we had some sort of internal warnings. Why do we, as human beings, never ever listen to those internal warnings? Why are we not informed to listen to those warnings that we feel inside us when our eye twitches and we know something bad is going to happen? When we see visions of something bad happening to us or to our children, why don't we listen to that? The next hurdles that we have experienced throughout the years are convincing our community, the RCMP, and at that time, our mayor. We had a problem and we needed help. Why didn't these people believe us? Why did we even have to try to convince them? Even with the fact that there was already one Aboriginal girl missing from our community prior to Ramona's disappearance. Why didn't they believe us? Why didn't they believe the family that had already had a girl that was missing from their family? And I'm speaking about Delphine Nicole. She was missing four years prior to Ramona. That family tried their hardest to bring it to the attention of our community that their daughter, their sister was missing. And like my mother said, we are a lucky family because we were able to find Ramona's body And the fact that I was working in a place that worked with families, I was able to quickly make connections where I needed to go to bring this out to the media. I had connections with people that I worked with in the community. 
I believe if I didn't have those connections, I wouldn't be standing here today. And I don't think there'd be any public inquiry happening right now. The successes that we have had have been the governing body that carries the can, implementing a coordinator there, and now the commission. And most of all, what has been really awesome is everyone here in this room to be able to collaborate and to come together to try to find some solutions. I find those successes. Right now, not being able to find the answers on what happened to my sister or who did this to her, I know that's a long shot. But what can be done right now to prevent this from happening again is what I look forward to every day. I think about ways that I can help the future generation. I work with preschoolers. Every one of those children I see, I also see a part of my sister in that. And that is why I continue to do this kind of work. Sorry, we're talking about. <laughs> if it is ever your job to assist, please, I just ask. that the police told us when we asked for help. Sorry, I'm just losing some memories here. If a family ever comes to you to ask for assistance, please don't tell them that their child probably just needs a break from them. This is something the RCMP told us. It does nothing to ease the parents' thoughts of the danger that their child could be in. As my mom said, of what her thoughts were about my sister. Nor does it assist in opening that parent's mind to think about where their child could be or whom they could be with. I don't want to think about my child wanting a break from me. I just want to know where they are. The next painful issue is this story. Yes, in fact, this is a story. Doesn't have a happy ending. But the truth is that every story is sellable. Every story is a money maker in some form. The story becomes a book, a song, a poem, a rally, a symposium, a walk for justice. Where is this justice when people are doing this not for justice or answers, but for personal gain or financial benefits? This is our story of tra tragedy and very real pain. How do we deal with people that ride on tales of this story to gain fame and fortune? How do we find the funds that we need to keep up the awareness in our communities when our story is being used to solicit funds for their benefit? These are only questions that I bring up that I'm looking for solutions for. 
because throughout the times that we've had to um, do the walks and stuff and bring awareness to our community, we've also had to deal with other people trying to do the same thing without consulting any of the families, which this tra tragedy has been um, bestowed upon. How do we deal with that? I still don't understand how we do that. The last but most important aspect of this story is the family. If you are to assist this family, look at the whole family. Mother, father, sister, brother, niece, and nephew, grandmothers, and grandfathers. <clears throat> Ask how each of these family members are being impacted by the missing or murdered loved one. When one family member is impacted, the rest of the family is also impacted. So some of the questions that I ask now is, why were we not offered any assistance to deal with the grief individually and as a whole family? There needed to be an intervention either from the community or the extended family. In this day and age, we seem to have lost our extended family. We have forgotten how to reach out to the rest of our family, our uncles, our aunties, and any of our relatives that could have assisted us through this trauma. Our minds were so closed, our hearts were so broken that we didn't even know to look in that direction. When it looks like the family is doing fine, because they say they are doing fine, look again. Look deep. No one is ever fine after they have been traumatized. So I'm just asking you today is to help, help, help. How you help is up to you. Sometimes all it takes is a shoulder to cry on, an ear to hear the pain, a heart to empathize with the pain, or a hug to feel cared about. No matter how old the person may be, they need to know that someone is there to listen to their story. Be aware that as that person changes, be it their age, be it an addiction, or their emotions, the story is the same. The needs for that person or family will be different. This is our story. You are our community. You are the shoulder to cry on. What can you do? And throughout this conference, I just ask if that's something that you can think about, not only for us, but for people, for other families that come to you with their story of trauma or just everyday life that they can't deal with. So in closing, I would just like to do a song in honor of the missing and murdered women. I don't have music or anything to go with it. If you know the song, you can join in. 
It's called Precious Memories, and if you could all stand. And this song is usually used for funerals, but I would like to use it for these ladies that have gone missing or that have been murdered, because they are all precious. And each of them has beautiful memories that they brought to our lives. Thank you. 